Senate Study Bill 1172, uh, Unemployment Insurance uh, Trust Fund Tax Reform. Uh, this is a, it's a 10 division bill. Uh, there's a lot of information in here. Uh, I, I think everybody's familiar with what we have in front of us. We have a one hour subcommittee. I went the extra half hour because I believed we'd have a lot of, uh, a lot of input to hear. Uh, what I'd like to do is I have uh, already asked the other senators, Senator uh, Bolton, Senator Dickey, if they'd like to have opening comments. We would all like to go straight to public comment and get as much in as we can. Uh, I don't know if we'll run out of time at the end or not. About uh, all five, eight minutes before the end of the hour, I will have to stop input and we will go to uh, closing comments by the senators. So with that, if people would start hitting the electronic hand at the uh, bottom of the uh, bottom of the screen, uh, we will start calling people in name. And I, I like to always give the next person a warning that they are after the next speaker. So we will start with JD Davis and uh, next is Felicia Hilton. So, J.D., could you go ahead and open the meeting? Uh, thank you, Senators. Uh, uh, I am J.D. Davis. I represent the Iowa Association of Business and Industry. Uh, ABI uh, is made up of 1,500 Iowa employers in 99 counties uh, that employ over 330,000 uh, employees. Uh, we have asked for consideration of Senate Study Bill 1172, and thank you for having it in front of you today. A little bit of background, uh, the COVID-19 experience is not only a, uh, a health experience, a public health uh, event, it also was a, a large economic and an employment event as well. And it has uh, caused our organization to reflect on the, uh, the status of the trust fund uh, dollars, uh, the sustainability, uh, and has us, uh, doing a great deal of, of, of look at what just was the experience for the trust fund. And, and it's, it's worth noting that in 2020, uh, employers paid uh, over $400 million into the unemployment trust fund. Uh, $1.2 billion in claims came out of the fund. And Iowa is a, 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 a stands out as a state where of the CARES Act funding that was received by the state of Iowa, uh, Governor Reynolds allocated 40% uh, of those dollars, uh, about $490 million of the CARES Act money Iowa received was uh, placed into the uh, Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund uh, to offset uh, the costs of the extraordinary claims that were made uh, in, during pandemic. And it should be noted that then prevented a $400 million unemployment tax increase for employers in the state of Iowa. Uh, and uh, we are concerned that uh, we understand that there are business cycles and we will always be in periods of growth and retraction. And that the, the next time uh, we very may well not have a, a lifeline thrown to the unemployment trust fund such as it was done in 2020. So for those reasons and others, uh, we began uh, uh, looking at reforms that could be made to the system. It is also worth noting that we should be very proud in Iowa uh, of, of how we do administer and treat the uh, uh, claimants. There is no state in the country that has a lower cost of living and a higher uh, payment of average weekly wages replacements through the claim process in Iowa. So with that as background, uh, I'd like to go through the divisions of the bill, the sections of the bill rather, uh, to let you know uh, what is in front of you and, and the purposes for those, those uh, proposals. Please do, and, thank you. I'm sorry? Oh, please do, I think that's a good idea. Okay, very good. Uh, sections one and two uh, deal with definitions. Uh, there is, you know, as a matter of public policy, senators, you're familiar, uh, the purpose of putting definitions into the Iowa code is to make sure that uh, that is the point at which they're interpreted and uh, not then later at administrative levels or uh, in uh, proceedings outside of the legislature and courts and otherwise. Uh, so what you will see here is that uh, the definitions of able to work and available to work are taken from federal definitions uh, and placed into Iowa code. So there is no misunderstanding of what that means. Similarly, there is a uh, definitions of severance pay also included 
in uh, the first section. Section two simply uh, strikes some definitional language that goes to uh, dependent uh, claims, uh, which are dealt with in section three. Uh, section three uh, does uh, cover uh, dependent payments, which is a, uh, a feature of Iowa unemployment uh, compensation that is shared only by 12 other states. There are only 13 states in the country uh, that uh, pay dependent claims as well as uh, the claimant of the employee. Uh, and uh, in the Midwest, only Iowa and Illinois. So our competitive contiguous states, only Illinois to the east. Uh, some states make this list as paying dependents, uh, but it really is kind of a misnomer. For example, in the case of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, they pay uh, three or five dollars a week for a dependent. It's really not, it, they make the list, but it's not a substantial uh, uh, payment. Uh, Iowa ranks eighth in those 13 states. And I think it's also worth noting that those seven states before us, five of those states find themselves in negative balance in their unemployment trust funds. Uh, what we've done uh, and put in front of you is instead of having a sliding scale of, uh, of additional dependents, uh, we have simply had a, 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 a program of do you have dependents or do you not have dependents? If you do have dependents, uh, we pay as though you have two dependents. Uh, this will, we believe, uh, uh, and with consultation with workforce development to understand that this is one of the greatest areas of errors, omissions, auditing, and fraud uh, that, uh, that the, the uh, workforce development deals with. Uh, it's difficult for the, uh, the claimant because when the workforce does find that they've overclaimed dependents, uh, they, uh, the unemployed individual is then required to repay the fund. And so, we're trying to simplify this. It's set at two dependents because frankly, uh, the average uh, family size in Iowa is 2.4 individuals. We think that that is a good amount. Again, remember I said that uh, Iowa pays some of the highest average weekly wage, uh, wage replacements. Uh, this would have uh, a person with dependents getting 57% of their average weekly wage replaced and in the form of benefits to them. Um, section four uh, deals with what we believe is an anachronistic portion of the, uh, of the unemployment uh, law, and it goes to plant closings. And uh, uh, the, the idea uh, behind the original language would be to increase uh, benefits and it lengthen the time that benefits are allowed uh, when there is an issue of a plant closing. Uh, we can't find any, any use of this portion of the code uh, in the last 30 years uh, uh, and really believe that workforce today uh, is not uh, a town by town issue. We're finding that, that uh, workers travel and that uh, we really, we have a much more regional workforce today. Uh, section five uh, goes to um, uh, the one week waiting period uh, for beneficiaries of, or claimants of the fund. Uh, Iowa is one of only nine states uh, that does not have a one week waiting period. There are no other states in the upper Midwest that do not have a one week waiting period. One week waiting period is important for administrators of the fund so that they can make preliminary determinations on the uh, uh, availability of the appropriateness of paying uh, the claims to those that are making those claims to uh, make sure that they're qualified. Um, and then section six goes to suitable work. Uh, and uh, there is a concept in current uh, um, Iowa code uh, as, that is an incentive to try to uh, uh, coerce workers back to employment uh, by reducing uh, the threshold of replacement income a new job offers over time. Uh, section, uh, section six simply uh, increases that incentive. Uh, section, uh, sections eight and nine make, uh, make changes uh, to what we call final determinations. And this uh, uh, is an attempt to set the, the agency, the department, 
as the entity that is responsible for the findings of facts in cases before workforce development and reserves then findings of law to be the purview of uh, the courts and the ALJs that come along after those findings uh, and makes those findings of fact uh, follow through in, in any one of the, the but any follow along proceeding. Uh, and then finally, uh, section 10 then uh, is the enactment clause. And this is the, the changes that are in front of you uh, it, per the enactment clause in this legislation would be in uh, July of 2021. I will say we did, less than 24 hours ago, we did have a uh, subcommittee in the, uh, in the House Labor Committee. And there was discussion with the chair of the Labor Committee and the chair of the subcommittee you know, uh, that that date should be adjusted to make sure that we are clear of the pandemic uh, and then uh, set the take changes in at that at a later time. But uh, that is open for discussion. I, I'm available to answer any questions uh, uh, as, as members uh, would, would direct. So thank you very much for the opportunity today. Thank you very much. That was a nice opening then. Uh, we have uh, six hands up and thank you for sticking around close. We have uh, Dylan Bramlich followed by Peter Hurd. Hi, senators, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Great, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity this morning. Um, Dylan Gramlich, uh, represent the Labor's International Union of North America. Um, I, uh, thanks for letting me start. Um, we strongly oppose the bill. Um, we've seen this um, legislation in some way, shape or form come up I believe the past two to three sessions. Um, uh, it, it has been modified a little bit this year. Um, and uh, so this is nothing new. Um, however, I find it's it's ill-timed. Um, we're in the middle of a uh, we're still in the middle of a global pandemic, and um, I think it's uh, it, it just seems a little inhumane to take away people's um, unemployment benefits uh, um, through no fault of their own, losing employment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me go into why we um, why we oppose one the dependence language. Um, to suggest that people are being penalized uh, for having more than uh, more than one child. Uh, we just don't see a, a need for um, that to be in there. Uh, the, Mr. Davis pointed out we're one of 13 states that um, has uh, more has language like this, and I think that makes us stand out in a good way. Um, so uh, the one week waiting period. Adverse effects construction work because um, we are at least once a year uh, subject to layoffs from um, uh, jobs finishing up and starting up. Um, so uh, that adversely affects the construction industry uh, and the plant closing language. Um, it, it, it's it was just nice to know that there um, you know would be a cushion there if we had a big plant closure. Um, uh, I know Senator Gronstall, uh, Mike Gronstall, used the um, Maytag and Newton as an example, uh, and we just uh, we just don't think that's necessary either. Um, but th those are my comments. Um, I, I appreciate the time. Uh, again, we oppose the bill, and um, you know, really, just this isn't the right time to be cutting people's uh, benefits. So, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. And Peter Hurd, uh, followed by, uh, I see Kay Harrison. Peter. Uh, thank you, members of the, of the committee. Um, there's been a lot of like, a lot of facts and figures that have been put out about this and there, we're not arguing with any of those, but I really want you to address the fact of the human need. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to understand what it's like for a worker when you are laid off uh, or be facing un, um, a countless weeks of unemployment. Uh, it really is a crisis for every time it happens. Uh, as a construction worker, I've seen people laid off. Uh, sometimes they have 20 years or two months. I've literally seen hundreds of people. I've been one of them several times. In the majority of the times, and I've seen this in plants too, you don't find out ahead of time. Uh, a lot of times it's Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. when your supervisor comes up and says, hey, we lost this project or um, we're not we're not selling any more bulldozers or something. And we don't know when we'll be busy. again." I've 
I've seen grown men sneak off quietly and cry and call their wives. And those conversations go to the home and the children. Job loss hits people hard. And especially around holidays when a lot of times that comes, like, I, I don't know the facts and numbers on it, but the majority of job losses that I've seen in construction happen around uh, the holidays between Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know, that one unemployment check of four to 500 bucks might be somebody's mortgage payment or a medical bill paid. I really hope that we can come to some kind of compromise on this bill so it's not just a just taking a hatchet to this unemployment bill and slicing it up it's it does have impact on people in their lives and i understand there's financial aspects to this but maybe we should figure out an alternative because that one week of unemployment is incredibly important to people and sometimes it, you know, maybe it might even be their only couple of weeks. You know, these are hardworking people who went to work and earned these benefits. So I just, I plead with you uh, from my heart to, to look at this and maybe try and find some sort of compromise on this. So thank you for letting me speak today. Um, and my name's Pete Hurd with the Iowa Federation of Labor, AFL-CIO. Sorry about that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Kay Harrison followed by Scott Putney. Hi, Senators. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Yes. Um, my name is Kelly Harrison. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I'm sorry. My name is Kelly Harrison. I am a proud UAW member of Local 893 in Marshalltown, and I represent over 9,000 UAW members and 10,000 um, retired members in the state of Iowa, and many of them of whom are your constituents. I rise in opposition of SSB 1172. Um, this has been a very difficult year for all of us during this COVID-19. Our essential workers in manufacturing stepped up to the challenges presented by this virus. They continued to work during this pandemic and in some cases produced a lot of the PPE to protect these frontline workers. Here in Iowa, workers at John Deere switched from building tractors to providing face shields. And Sears Seeding, they built gowns again for the frontline workers. If this wasn't stressful enough, some members had to find daycare for their children who were not home due to the pandemic. This was an expense that a lot of these workers weren't planning on having to contend with. Do we really wanna attack these workers? Do we wanna take away a week's pay because they are laid off? A layoff that they have not caused or could not prevent or avoid? Some companies, they built to order, like John Deere. You know, Every year, these people get laid off. Did they ask for it? No. So they're gonna lose a week's pay because of something that they did not cause or prevent. Some companies build to order and they lay off their employees uh, regularly. Um, is this fair? No. Um, so let's be clear. Nobody gets rich on unemployment either, nor do they wanna be unemployed. And sign up for unemployment, it can be difficult because you can't talk to a human being anymore. A lot of it is electronically and some people don't have access to broadband. They can't find a computer to log in. So that makes it more complicated. And talking about the CARES Act, the money that Iowa got was our money. We are taxpayers and that money came back to Iowa. Unemployment is a safety net. It is for people who need help while they're out of work when they're not receiving any income. And now you wanna dock their unemployment to lower the benefit amount because of their independence. Again, is that fair? And have any of you ever been unemployed um, due to a plant closing? Well, I have. And let me tell you, it's not fun. Um, it's not a good experience. I was 51 years old. And actually I was out of town. I found out um, over the internet that my plant was closing. And I had worked there faithfully for 27 and a half years. I didn't miss any work and I didn't ask to be laid off or plant closing worse. Um, it was me and 900 other employees were devastated. Only imagine, you know, that you weren't told, you know, that you were gonna lose nor did you have any fair warning that your plant was gonna close. And here I am 51 years old, I have a high school education and I put 27 and a half of my best years working for a facility that I thought I'd work 30 years and hopefully reach retirement. 
So here you have 900 employees out looking for a job. Jobs aren't readily available that make the same amount of money. I want a comparable job, not going from $24 an hour down to $10 an hour. Um, I had kids getting ready to go to college. I had, uh, um, you know, so you bring on all that extra depression. There was a lot of people that had no idea what they were going to do. So you have stress. And now you want to lower the amount of time that people get. Let me tell you, it takes a while to figure this out. You have to um, figure out maybe how you're going to, um, who do, what resources do you use? I never had filed for unemployment 27 and a half years. I wasn't laid off, thank goodness. Now I have to file for unemployment. I have to do a resume. I have to go out looking for work in order to qualify for unemployment. And a lot of those jobs weren't paying good money. You know, so lowering the weeks of unemployment is detrimental to our people. You know, again, I'm asking, you know, that you reconsider some of that because uh, it's very difficult to find a job, you know, and to keep your life on track to where you were. Because again, there's a lot of muscle, uh, mental stress that goes um, into that. Um, and again, it wasn't something that these employees ask for. Nobody wants to be laid off. And um, it's an employer that put them there. They didn't ask for it. So I would hope that you would not move SSB forward. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Scott Putney, followed by Tom Chapman. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, senators, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm here today to state my opposition to SSB 1172. Um, Kelly sp spoke very well on uh, a lot of the things I want to talk about. Um, in 2014, I myself, along with 300 other friends, families, co-workers, lost their jobs due to do a plant closure in Council Bluffs. I'm from Council Bluffs. Um, it, I was very fortunate. I was one of the lucky ones. I was out of work for about two and a half months before I found uh, suitable employment. But a lot of my coworkers, a lot of my friends uh, did not. Uh, and they, a lot of them were older uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, not old enough to retire, but uh, too old to, to really transition well into a new job. They needed that extra 13 weeks. It's real money. It's real money to these people. Um, I know because I lived through it and I saw uh, co-workers go through it and try to find uh, new employment. Um, the, uh, many of the co I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting lost here. Um, these, my co-workers were not lazy. They were not uh, trying to get out of work. They did not want to work. They wanted to work. Um, they just could not find suitable employment. Uh, in Iowa unemployment, you have to track your job searches and you have to have that um, uh, listed w w in order to continue to keep getting your, your benefits. So these people are, they're trying to get jobs. It's just difficult. And if you haven't been through that process, I don't think you understand or realize the difficulty it puts on your family, on, on everything, on your life, just trying to get food and, and keep the roof over your head and put food on the table. Um, so with that said, I also want to go a little bit into the scheduled shutdowns or the, the, the one week waiting period. Um, a lot of plants, including the plant that I came from and other plants that, that I know that, that people who work at schedule shutdowns once or twice a year. They schedule these one week maintenance shutdowns um, where the, the, the workers are, are unemployed for a week to do putting this one week, uh, waiting period on basically forces workers to get no income for for one week at a time uh it, i just think it's unfair it's unjust uh as we're going through this pandemic right now this is the worst time to try to start taking away uh uh benefits from anybody we should be doing the opposite we should be we should be adding to the benefits um also uh local economies rely on this when they like when we had our plant close plant closure. Um, this is real money that goes back in the, in the economy. These people aren't getting rich off this. Nobody's making a living on unemployment or they're just trying to get by. And every dime that you give these individuals, that dime is going right back in the economy to pay for, for the things that they need, the essential things they need. So with that being said, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Good deal. Thank you. Thank you. You did a nice job. Thank you. 
um, Tom Chapman followed by Nick Laning. Uh, thank you, Senators. Uh, my name is Tom Chapman. I'm the Executive Director of the Iowa Catholic Conference, which is the public policy group for the Catholic bishops in Iowa. And we are opposed to the bill. I do wanna say I agree with JD in terms of thanking the governor for what she did with the CARES Act money for the unemployment system. Actually, the Iowa Catholic Conference is a reimbursing employer and we run the unemployment insurance program for the more than 6,000 employees in the Catholic schools of Iowa. So we appreciate what the governor did for that. Uh, a couple of reasons for our opposition. Uh, one is section three in terms of lowering the benefits for those uh, workers who have three or more dependents. We disagree with that. We support family-friendly policies. Uh, bigger families need more help. And we think that's a good part of Iowa's law. And we hope you would keep that. I realize that it might make it a little easier for workforce development to change that. And I'm very sympathetic to what they're dealing with because as an employer, we dealt with that as well, 10 times the number of claims. I know there's a lot of issues with that, but we'd like to see that stay the same. Um, in section five, we also oppose the addition of the one week waiting period. Uh, we realized that people would still possibly qualify for the same amount of maximum benefits, but that one week period and getting benefits right away is important. For some of us, maybe it wouldn't be that big a deal, uh, but for many families, it would be a very big deal. And this is about families and food and shelter. And the purpose of this program is really just to help people who have been laid off through no fault of their own. So I think we should be very cautious about making that change as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have uh, Nick uh, followed by Felicia Hilton. Thank you, Senators. My name is Nick Laning and I represent the IBEW, the Electrical Workers Union State Conference. We have 10,000 um, electrical workers across the state and we're opposed to this legislation for a couple of reasons. Um, and they've both been talked about so far. So the one week waiting period um, as some of uh, my colleagues have said, the, we have these layoffs when a project ends out of nowhere or there's a routine project end. And a one week waiting period, if you're living paycheck to paycheck is difficult. So this is just the bridge to the next project for some of our folks. Um, it also is um, when you're on that paycheck to paycheck budget for some of our younger workers in particular, the ones we wanna keep in Iowa to make sure we have enough in the trades um, are the ones who need this support. Our higher ups are making more money as they go through the trade program, right? Um, so, and then the plant closing piece, we just see that as a cushion if we have folks working in one of those um, organizations and the folks from some of the other organizations already spoke on that uh, for a long time. But um, our organization just sees this as why make a change to a program that's working here in Iowa and we have a solvent trust fund. So thank you for the time and the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, Felicia Hilton, followed by Michael Grunstall. Um, hi, my name is Felicia Hilton. I'm with the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, I'm on public Wi-Fi in the uh, unicameral in Nebraska. Oh. <laughs> just for another bill. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, as the carpenters, we are in opposition to the changes um, that have been proposed again um, to the unemployment uh, uh, insurance for uh, working people in Iowa. Um, mainly our opposition is um, first, I would like to say that I think that we should be honoring every worker in Iowa for working through the pandemic, from trying to figure out how to raise their kids, work from home, all of these things people have sacrificed, people have risked their lives to work through the pandemic, whether they're in healthcare and even in construction, we lobby to be considered essential. Um, everybody wanted to try and remain working. And I think that there's a misunderstanding that workers um, have been afraid this whole year of the virus physically and financially. And this just adds to the current fear. Um, we are resilient people. Uh, we're salt of the earth here in Iowa. And I believe that this bill doesn't do any worker any good 
when we're in the middle of a pandemic. We have been serving um, the state and the community uh, in Iowa throughout this pandemic in many ways from healthcare workers, construction workers, grocery workers, um, all of the you know fiber optics and, and uh, IT people. Um, and then all of the linemen and millwrights that are keeping the power going right now during this devastating storm. And so we feel like as things ebb and flow with the pandemic, this is, a, is an earned benefit. It's an earned safety net. This is not some giveaway to working people in Iowa. This is a benefit that people have worked for, that people have sacrificed for, and God forbid, um, this virus attack your family physically or financially. And I'll give you an example. When a job site shuts down in Iowa for two or three days because we've had a case of COVID, the workers have to be home for two or three days. Um, they get tested, there's contact tracing. And we recognize the sacrifice that our employers have paid also in this pandemic, making sure that we're safe, making sure we have extra hands uh, washing stations and bathrooms and uh, contact tracing and even coming up with technology so we can make sure that we're six feet apart. And if we do come in contact with a worker on the site that has COVID, we're able to contact trace it. We've done a number of things to make sure collectively uh, labor management that we're safe, um, and we respect that. And so what we want to see is the state of Iowa show that same um, honor and respect to the working people um, in the state that have struggled and have faced dire consequences. Because when that uh, web, that uh, job site shuts down, we're out of work. And if you're in the trades, you earn every dollar you make. There is no PTO, no sick days, no vacation time. We have to prepare for working through days where there's inclement weather and we may not work. So we don't have this built-in system. We're a merit-based union. We're used to manning up, manning down. We don't have seniority. And this is just one of those things that I think is missing is that there are a lot of people that earn every dollar they make. They don't have perks and you know a bunch of benefits through work. They work and they get paid. And if they don't work, they don't get paid. And so this earned benefit is there for that very reason. There is a big gap in the safety net for working people. Um, and I'll say that that is part of the biggest reason that there is organized labor to collectively come together and pretty much resolve those gaps in the safety net for ourselves through collective bargaining. But for the workers that don't have that, this is one of the few things that they have that is an earned benefit, and that is unemployment insurance, just in case they get laid off for no fault of their own. And I believe we should be honoring these workers and paying uh, homage to both the workers and the businesses that have struggled through this. And I think this can be delayed. Um, I just think it's bad timing, bad optics, um, it's, you know, basically we've been a struggling not to be a sick and dying workforce in Iowa. And I would just like to see the state postpone this and let's have another conversation with stakeholders that really do benefit from um, this system if someone happens to be laid off. We've been left out of these conversations. And I know labor isn't, you know, liked very much in the Capitol at this point in time but I do believe that we're not speaking as the union, we're speaking on behalf of workers. And I would just hope that you would hear us this time on unemployment. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mike Grunstall followed by Carrie Duncan. D double tasking, I didn't mean to block you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Michael Grunstall. Can you guys hear me? Yes, now we can. Yep. Okay. Um, my name is Mike Gross. I represent I was State Building and Construction Trades. I have a few comments to make and then a, a brief piece that I'd like to read you. Um, the, my comment is the, for the building trades, this is pretty significant because essentially we have layoffs every year workers go out on the job and, and the job gets finished and they're laid off for a while so so probably more than any other profession this 
impacts the building trade. So when we wage and trade in, impacts us more than anybody else. Uh, if you're a factory worker and your factory does a regular um, maintenance shutdown, um, that's one week's pay out of their pocket, pure and simple. It costs them uh, if you pass this legislation and do away with that uh, one week waiting period. So um, that's, that's a couple of the problems with this, but let me also say, I don't, I don't quite understand. So if the, if the system is potentially out of balance and we are going to uh, drop into another tax table, because of unemployment in this state, um, if that's the problem, how worker play can do a little more themselves. This bill, all it does is, is does this to work you. If I can get to my screen here, um, let me read to you. 70 years ago, said when they enacted this 96.2, not many people actually, the, it, it lays out the rationale for doing this, like, for, for having unemployment benefits. And it's the guide for interpretation 96.2. As a guide to the interpretation and application of this chapter, the public policy of this state is declared to be as follows. Economic insecurity due to unemployment is a serious menace to the health, morals, and welfare of the people of this state. Involuntary unemployment is therefore a subject of general interest and concern which requires appropriate action by the legislature to prevent its spread and to lighten its burden, which now so often falls with crushing force upon the unemployed worker and the worker's family. The achievement of social security requires protection against this greatest hazard of our economic life. This can be provided by encouraging employers to provide more stable employment and by the systematic accumulation of funds during periods of employment to provide benefits for periods of unemployment thus maintaining the purchasing power and limiting the serious social consequences of poor relief assistance. The legislature therefore declares that in its considered judgment, the public good and the general welfare of the citizens of this state require the enactment of this measure under the police powers of the state for the compulsory setting aside of unemployment reserves to be used for the benefit of persons unemployed through no fault of their own. Um, I think it's a mistake. Uh, uh, that's a uh, close quote. Um, I think it's uh, important, not just for the employees, which, and it's incredibly important for them, but it's also important for the communities that when, when Electrolux closed down in Webster City or when uh, Maytag closed down in Newton, there's a pretty dramatic impact, not just on those workers, but on the community itself when they lose that payroll in the community for all of the main street businesses in that community. For that reason, we oppose this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, a little bit of that was a uh, slow bandwidth. I'm going to come back and uh, visit with you about some of the, the code so I can pick up some of what I missed. Okay. Uh, just so you know, I'll, I'll be back around. I'd like to get some of that information. Uh, Carrie Duncan, and that is the last hand I see up. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good morning, senators. Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. I am a uh, production operator employed by a subcontractor American Ordnance at the Iowa Army Ammunition Plant in Middletown, Iowa. I'm a member of the Machinist Union Local 1010. I am speaking out of great concern about this atrocity during a pandemic of wanting to make it more difficult, a financial hardship on Iowa working class citizens and their families when there comes a time, and that time is quite frequently at our facility, that they are in need of unemployment benefits in the state of Iowa. Let me speak to you of a recent example. Just last week, at our facility, 
there was approximately 85 to 90 operators that were in need of filing for one week of unemployment due to an unexpected issue that arose on the line at no fault of the workers. And our company could not fulfill the promise of a 40 hour work week for these operators on this specific line. And mind you, we have four to five lines on the facility, but this affected our line where I work. These are my coworkers. Some that have family at home to financially support that are counting on that 40 hour a week paycheck as the bills, those bills continue to come regardless. And now the state unemployment fund wants to impose during the pandemic further delays for them receiving an income due to a 10 day waiting period or the coworker that I sit across just the other night. His, he just lost his wife to cancer. And he suffered the mental anguish and the grief of loss. And now he has to worry about something about waiting for 10 days for an unemployment check to help cover his funeral expenses because he's out of work. Why? I ask you, why would we even want to put our hardworking Iowans in a position such as this. Another example, just down the road from us, a manufacturing company here in Burlington, Iowa, ABB recently announced before Christmas to their employees that they would be closing their facility in the spring of 2021. This affects approximately 400 workers. There are going to be a lot of these employees of whom will need the financial assistance through the Iowa Unemployment Insurance Fund until they can find another job. This factory closing will decimate our local economy and people will be less likely to shop locally and that will affect our local businesses. These workers were also promised already that they could be eligible for unemployment benefits for more than the 26 weeks. And now this preposterous notion of lowering the weeks to availability is completely a travesty to Iowa workers. I know one time when I lost my job there at the ammunition plant for six months, I went to a lower paying job making $7.25 an hour. And I can tell you that I was raised with a good work ethic like the rest of my coworkers. But you have to humble yourself to go to a lower paying job. And I didn't draw unemployment. What does that mean? send a message to to our Iowa workforce when we should be promoting a stronger and more prideful workforce in our state. I implore you to stop and think about the impact these changes would have on working class Iowans and their families. These are Iowans that are counting on their elected legislatures to do what is not only necessary, in providing working class Iowans with beneficial unemployment availability to benefit them and their families in difficult times, but to do what is just and right for all of our working class Iowans. Thank you very much for this time this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jim Chance, followed by Penny Logsdon. Thank you. There we go. I'm a president of UAW Local 893 in Marshalltown, and I directly represent a thousand workers here in Brown, Marshalltown. Uh, I'd like to relate back to real life experience, uh, how uh, unemployment affects our workers. In 2018, a tornado came through Marshalltown and severely damaged parts of town and some of our work facilities. So some of our members had to rely on unemployment to survive. Myself, I was lucky enough that I have my house paid off. I have my vehicles paid off. Uh, our children are raised and out of the house. So basically it's just the living expenses uh, at home that we have for bills. But that's not the case. Other members who have house payments, car payments, raising children, uh, 
they need those benefits as soon as possible. When I signed up for unemployment and then also made a claim, it was three to four weeks before I received my first payment. That's very hard for these families who have to live paycheck to paycheck to pay their bills. So some real life experience for you there. Thank you for your hospitality. I oppose this bill. Thank you uh, for speaking. Uh, Penny Logston followed by Drake Custer. And we're coming up on 10 minutes till the hour. We will have to uh, move to, to Senator closing comments here soon. Can you hear me now? Sorry. There we go. Yes. Okay. Sorry for the wait. All Senators and legislators, thank you. Legislators, thank you for allowing me to speak with you during this most important committee meeting. My name is Penny Logston, president of the Lee County Labor Chapter. There is no doubt that the final decisions made regarding this proposed legislation will have lasting and rippling effects on our state, counties, and communities. Unemployment legislation was created to be a safety net to prevent Iowa citizens from losing everything. Reducing reduction of current unemployment benefits in any way will affect all Iowans. Iowa workers are dedicated, skilled, and take pride in their work, their home, and their communities. I have recently, recently retired from the Lee County Mental Health and Disability Office, and during my 24 years plus years of service, I also worked in the General Relief Office. I'm a member of the IUPAT PPME Local 2003. Just this month, I am celebrating 42 years as a realtor. I have witnessed manufacturing layoffs and closing, lockouts by employers, temporary worker em workers' employment, and over and over again, job losses due to business closing. When Kilcook Steel Castings moved to Mexico, more than 300 workers lost their careers due to no fault of their own. Manufacturers are allowed to keep temporary workers for over a year and letting them go and letting them go and repeat this hiring practice again and again. We've seen local businesses close and it is not hot. And when it is not possible for community businesses and manufacturers to absorb these workers in a short period of time, this loss of income affects not only the workers, it greatly affects their communities. I began seeing the lack of normal property maintenance. I then witnessed workers and families losing their homes and their equity in their home and that they had been building for years workers losing their transportation, individuals losing their health care, the ability to go to the dentist or get eyeglasses because there wasn't money to get a pres prescription. It took five to seven years for our, our communities to rebuild from losses that occurred from manufacturer closings. Our employed, employed workers were forced to choose between our unemployed workers were forced to choose between food, prescriptions, utilities, and necessities required to survive. I witnessed the schools stepping up to work with those with more homeless families and take on more reduced and free lunches. Community food banks, churches, local businesses, and organizations experienced their request for charity, charitable giving, in, giving increase. Workers play a huge part in our community, charities and programs. It is imperative that current unemployment benefits not be reduced in any way so that our dedicated, experienced, skilled workers are able to stay and continue to work in Iowa. Do not force them to leave our communities, but rather consider their value to Iowa and their communities. Please do not decrease Iowa unemployment benefits in any way. Our communities thank you for this consideration. Our citizens consider, thank you for this consideration and our workers. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Drake Custer, if you could uh, quickly give us your, uh, your, uh, your thoughts and then we're going to go to senators. Yes, thank you. My name is Drake Custer. I currently work as a business agent for Teamsters Local 238. 
However, 10 years ago, um, I was a member of BCTGM 48G and was on unemployment for about 10 months due to a lockout from Roquet America. Um, it's already been spoken on several times today what the effect of prolonged unemployment does to a local economy and a local community. Um, so I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on that. The reality is, in that kind of prolonged unemployment, families are forced to make a choice in the name of survival versus the name of prosperity or uh, fulfillment or enjoyment. It is merely about survival. And the choice to remove 13 weeks of unemployment benefits from communities that are already suffering from a business closing is only going to encourage people to leave the community or leave the state. And so I ask you to reconsider this bill because this is not going to magically will people into prosperity or magically will them into another gainful employment. Um, it is merely going to put them with a choice to whether or not to stay and lower their quality of life or move on and find a better quality of life elsewhere. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. Um, with that, we're all of the hands are uh, are down now, so we we did hear from everybody. Um, Senator Bolt, do you have any comments? Yes, thanks, Senator Schultz. Uh, really appreciate all of the contributions we had from uh, concerned members of the public here, both uh, the explanation of the the legislation as well as the responses to it. Um, in, in listening to this, I think we have a pretty clear case that's been made that this is a really bad idea at a really bad time. Um, when we look at the, what, what was described as the, the COVID-19 employment event, um, absolutely, it, it was a major employment event and we have to be concerned about what the next em employment event may look like. And it may be a natural disaster, it may be a virus, it may be uh, just an economic downturn for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, this legislation is going to make it harder for Iowa to navigate that crisis. Because what's gonna happen is the, the very nature of these unemployment benefits being distributed and into the pockets of workers who've lost their jobs to no fault of their own helps soften the blow. It makes sure that those local economies can thrive because workers are able to continue to pay their bills on time, to, to be able to kind of mute the effects of, of a sudden job loss. Uh, when we look at the, the impact of this legislation, um, the, the first thing that I, I take a look at is, um, you know, it's, it's solving the wrong problem. If we want to talk about how the COVID pandemic caused an employment event, we really should be talking about having an adequate paid family leave system. So we aren't trying to use unemployment event benefits to replace that benefit that's missing in our state. Uh, Cause other states had those benefits and, and frankly came out better because of it. Um, when we look at the uh, impact of what, what this legislation is going to do, uh, we're going to have massive reductions of benefits to workers who are already in suddenly a, a bad situation because of a plant closing, because of something happening at their place of employment that's no fault of their own. And suddenly they're going to be put in a position where they're, they're going to have no income. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an immediate impact on their lives. Uh, we, we should not be steering things in this direction for what, what objectively is a very marginal impact on our unemployment benefit system as a whole. Huge benefit to the individual um, that, that's gonna be missing here. Um, I look at the suitable work provision. Um, I think that has a lot of problems for employers as well. Uh, it's gonna encourage people to go out and take jobs that they have no intention to stay at because they can't afford not to. And so you're gonna have an employer go through multiple job searches for the same opening because they're gonna hire somebody that simply is gonna, gonna be there to fill some weeks until they find the real job that their skills actually translate into well and, and pays better. And so they su succeed in making that transition. That's a major concern, I think, for, for both sides of, of the table here. Um, I look at the, um, the impact on dependents. I think that's the exact wrong way for us to, to figure out the impact on individual I Iowans in, in these benefit systems. Um, and then, you know, the, the waiting week itself, um, what we've heard about the project to project workers, that's going to have a, a disproportionate impact on, on those people um, that are out there trying to make those transitions smoother. 
and you look at the what we have as, as fiscal information on this, that's it's 23.3 million in benefits that disappear from the pockets of workers in this program. That's that's a meaningful impact on a lot of lives and going to be a meaningful impact on Iowa's economy at the exact wrong time for that to happen. So we have a good benefit system. We tend to see the result of that softening the economic trends that affect the nation here in Iowa. We tend to have a, a little bit smoother edge to some of these employment um, issues as we, as we see downturns in the economy. We have um, a bill here that hits individual workers hardest at exactly the worst time in their lives. Uh, this is a bad idea at any time, but a really bad idea when we've just seen the impact that it can have on, on people's lives. So um, Senator Schultz, I, I appreciate our ability to work together and try to, to solve problems. Unfortunately on this one, I just don't see a way we're gonna fix this legislation that's gonna do the right thing by Iowa workers. So um, I am not gonna sign on this. Thank you, Senator Bolton, Senator Dickey. We are right at the 10 minutes and or at the hour and the next subcommittee is coming in. Do you have anything? No, I just thank everybody for expressing their thoughts uh, today. Um, um, difficult subject for, for all ends, but appreciate everybody sharing their time and, and certainly a few more things to consider. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. I took notes on each speaker, uh, gives me the opportunity to see what the recurring themes are and uh, take a look at those specific sections. So thank you. With that, we're going to adjourn the subcommittee and I uh, will visit again. I, I will be signing this out of subcommittee. I mean, I'll say that publicly. Good deal. I will as well. And you will as well. Thank you. Thank That'll you. Be.